I, I'm a respiratory physician. I, I'm sitting in a room full of intensivists, so I feel slightly fearful, I have to say. And uh, we were saying earlier that uh, intensivists and respiratory physicians do NIV differently. Uh, I'd like to say I, I don't think there's a right answer, um, but I know what you're thinking. I'm thinking it too. <laughs> so I'm just going to be talking about the, um, the, um, the indications, uh, um, uh, how to do it or how um, we tend to do it in, within respiratory uh, medicine. Um, I'm going to focus on hypercapnic respiratory failure just, just simply because Louise has, has, has given such a comprehensive overview of the current evidence. The evidence for acute hypercapnic respiratory failure in NIV is, is old, um, so we need to be focusing really more on quality rather than, uh, rather than you know, trying to find new evidence that it works because it works. Um, so acute hypercapnic respiratory failure, in particular exacerbations of COPD, um, are important. Uh, there's, a, there's a significant mortality. Uh, significant readmission rate, and then it's, there's an extremely poor long-term prognosis. It doesn't matter where you look, um, your prognosis within a year to two years is, is, is the mortality is 50 odd percent, whether it's in the States, whether it's in the UK, whether it's in, in, in the Far East. And pH is important um, in determining the prognosis we see in uh, some really quite old studies now um, that uh, I'm hoping that most of you won't have been around to see these studies, actually. I'm, it's just possible, actually, that... Um, so they may be new to you, but for, for they're really quite old. But, um, but of course, the, uh, the, the NIV success or failure is very much dependent on the trajectory of your pH during non-invasive ventilation, uh, and pH in the early studies was very much the only indicator of IC admission. Um, so is there any point in patients um, who aren't acidotic to ventilate. And again, this is not something we think about, but it's always good to just go back and see why we don't ventilate patients who are hypercapnic, um, but are present, uh, present acutely with a normal pH. And it's because it's got, uh, it has no difference on the, on the uh, length of stay. It does improve breathlessness more quickly, um, but there are no physiological benefits. Mm -hmm. Then, of course, in acidotic patients, there's reduction in pH, there's an improvement in dyspnea, reduction in uh, length of stay and intubation rates, all data that you're familiar with, but it's important to note that the vast majority of NIV in the UK rightly or wrongly occurs on the general wards. And it's important to remember that in the original study, uh, last in 2000, that the benefits of ward-based NIV are very much in favour of those patients with a mild acidosis with a pH greater than 7.3, not those with the, with, the, with the more severe pH. Now, of course, has resource implications, but we'll talk a little bit about how we manage or how we are currently managing patients with mild and severe respiratory acidosis later. Again, old data, reduction in mortality, reduction in need for, for endotracheal intubation, reduction in length of stay. The data are less prominent for obesity-related respiratory failure, and about 40% of the patients we now set up on the Lane Fox unit on home non-invasive ventilation uh, have got obesity either with or without COPD, and the majority of those patients will come to us after an acute exacerbation, acute acidotic episode. The data are pretty scant, and, and there are no real randomized controlled trials in patients with, uh, with, with obesity hypoventilation syndrome. But again, this relatively old study shows that the outcomes in terms of readmission risk are similar to COPD, but patients with COPD have a significantly higher old, uh, mortality uh, than those with OHS. Uh, and similarly, uh, patients with uh, obesity hypoventilation and COPD, so the COPD OSA overlap syndrome, um, uh, have a better prognosis than those with COPD alone. Now, if you see a patient with, a, with, with, a, with an FEV1 greater than 1 uh, with hypercapnic respiratory failure, uh, have a look at their BMI because they, they've almost certainly got some sleep disorder breathing as well contributing to their respiratory failure, and that's important to address too. The third important indication for uh, non-invasive ventilation here is, uh, is neuromuscular disease. Patients are surviving longer with congenital uh, myopathies. They're presenting to our emergency departments more frequently, um, mainly because of, of, of people like us keeping these patients ventilated and, and trying to maximize their quality of life. And as you can see, um, with Duchenne muscular dystrophy, um, for example, 
you see a, a marked drop off in the uh, FE, uh, FEC uh, around about the age of 18. And it's around about that age that you might expect to see these patients presenting to the emergency department, although increasingly we, we, with, uh, with better transition services between pediatrics and adult care, those acute decompensations are less common. We transition patients much earlier onto NIV before they uh, run into problems. But once you ventilate these patients with, uh, with, with uh, um, um, neuromuscular disease, Duchenne muscular dystrophy, uh, you improve their prognosis significantly, uh, mainly through improving their respiratory muscle function. So this is before they're ventilated, and this is afterwards, home ventilation that is. Their CO2 improves, and uh, the time they spend with low SpO2 also significantly improves. So these patients will decompensate when they have pneumonia. Uh, and the criteria now for, um, for ventilating these patients, you should try and, uh, for, for both for obese patients and for patients with neuromuscular disease, if they're somnolent and they're in respiratory distress, um, regardless of, of their acidosis, it's worth ventilating them acutely. Um, and I would very much advocate that, that, that these patients in particular um, do not receive, um, if, they're, if they're not acidotic, but they're struggling to breathe, uh, I, I think these patients in particular, I, I don't think benefit from high flow. There's no evidence, but, but these patients have got primary pump failure, and what they need is, um, is a ventilator. I'm going to skim over, really, the evidence of a, for acute cardiogenic pulmonary edema and NIV. Again, very old data demonstrating that mortality and intubation risk are improved. And I think, Louise, I think you've described in some detail acute hypoxemic respiratory failure, uh, and the benefits of NIV. The only thing I'd mention, actually, is this, is this trial from Fratt and colleagues um, from 2016 that you can see on the far right, whereas earlier data might have indicated some benefits to, um, to non-invasive ventilation in patients with immunosuppression. Um, uh, this study here shows that, uh, sh shows that uh, intubation risk uh, is lowest with high flow, um, uh, and, and in fact, NIV uh, was both a risk factor, risk factor both for intubation and for mortality. Um, once again, for these following slides, I think, I think um, Louise has covered these in much more detail and better detail than I could possibly do, um, so I'm going to skip through those, particularly uh, with respect to time. Um, so how then do we set up non-invasive ventilation? We've talked about the indications what about the contraindications? Well, the absolute contraindications in the BTS guidelines indicate that we should avoid patients with severe facial deformity, facial burns, and fixed upper airway obstruction. But then what about the relative contraindications? And it's interesting to note here that an undrained pneumothorax is not considered to be a contraindication of the BTS, latest BTS guidelines, which admittedly from 2016. Uh, I would not advocate starting non-invasive ventilation on a patient with undrained pneumothorax. Um, so um, hopefully that will be uh, included as a subsequent point. So what about those patients with a GCS less than 8? Should they receive non-invasive ventilation? And increasingly, I think they do. And there's reasonable evidence that if patients have got hypercapnic encephalopathy, um, that, that they do benefit from non-invasive ventilation. Uh, and the outcomes are excellent. Um, and, and NIV failure in these patients are associated with, with a failure of the GCS to improve. So patients without hypercapnic coma don't improve. So it's very much a relative contraindication. So then we come to setting up acute NIV. And this is where I think there is a discrepancy between highly, you know, intensely supervised non-invasive ventilation in very sick patients on the ICU versus the patient uh, who's coming in through the emergency department who's perhaps not for, in, uh, not for intubation, who then gets set up on the, uh, uh, on the general ward or on the acute medical ward. Um, it's, it's, I think it's important to discuss because you see these patients um, and, and you advise on them um, and, and, and sometimes take them to, um, to, to critical care. Um, it's become a routine part of clinical practice, but the quality of delivery can be variable. And as early as 2008, um, we saw the opposite of what was seen in the trials, that patients who are acidotic who received NIV did worse than patients who are acidotic um, uh, 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 and didn't receive NIV, which is extraordinary. 
the NCPOD study, I'm sure many of you are familiar with, uh, looked at, uh, I think it was around 600 um, patients with, uh, with acute hypercapnic respiratory failure uh, or who required acute non-invasive ventilation and assessed essentially how well we were doing it. And a goodly proportion of these patients were in hypoxemic respiratory failure who classically would be treated, I think, in an intensive care environment. And pneumonia, um, patients were treated with pneumonia in about 12% of cases. The crux of this, this study, in, in my view, and I was a reviewer for this study, as I'm sure many of you were, was that in a quarter of cases, patients were deemed by reviewers to have received unacceptable or poor quality of care, which is extraordinary for a condition that affects perhaps one in, 20, one in 25 acute admissions through the, uh, through the emergency department. So about one in five acute exacerbations of C uh, admissions or exacerbations of COPD, about one in five of those will have hypercapnic respiratory failure. So the fact that we're failing a quarter of these patients is an ex extraordinary admission of, 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 of failure, I think, and uh, much has been done to improve things. So, and again, the trials will say that the mortality is ar around the mid to high teens, but the mortality here was 35%. A third of patients received NIV 24 hours, more than 24 hours, after the recognition of acidosis. Looking at the settings, an extraordinary number of patients had no increase. A fifth of patients had no titration of their IPAP after their initial settings. And 42% were deemed to have received inappropriate ventilatory management. The EPAP, I think you could argue, and I have a particular bugbear about, about how we set EPAP in patients with COPD and obstructive sleep apnea. Um, but it, nonetheless, a lot of patients received an inappropriate level of EPAP, inappropriate high level of EPAP. So how do we get NIV right? We need to find the right patients, so acidotic but not too acidotic. In type 2 respiratory failure is the, is, is the main indication. At the right time, within the first hour, in the right environment, so if you've got severe acidosis, you should really be considered to be in critical care. I'm sorry to shunt all these patients your way, but that's what the evidence shows. And those with mild acidosis can be looked after on the general ward, but which general ward? And some elderly care wards have got superbly trained nurses for NIV. Some respiratory wards may not. And so this is very much service specific and so so the evidence and the and the improvements surrounding NIV now are much more about service improvement and quality improvement than about generating new data I hope you can see that um, and it needs to be delivered by the right people so again 45 percent of patients in the NCPOD study had their NIV <coughs> managed so life support managed by non-specialists I hope you wouldn't expect me to come along to the ICU and start fiddling with the uh, renal replacement therapy. Um, I might. I did do during COVID, actually. So what is it that we need for, to, to deliver good NIV? And this is an excellent ed editorial for Mark Elliott in Respirology a couple of years ago. So it's a mix of the academic, the clinical, and education. But on top of that, you need the diagnostic skills, the leadership, across the professions, not just medics, not just nurses, not just physios, but across the multidisciplinary team. It needs to be linked in with chronic disease management. There needs to be, obviously, an understanding of physiology, about the mechanics of NIV, but also an understanding of sleep physiology as well. And at, towards the sicker end of the spectrum, we need palliative and end-of-life care skills too. Do we deliver that in a consistent way with our patients coming through the door, the 75-year-old with an acute exas just another acute exacerbation of COPD? And I'm not certain that we always do across the board. So how do we start? Well, we communicate with the patient. We're fortunate in that most of our patients are awake. We make sure that we have a treatment escalation plan. We choose the right interface mode settings. So what about the mask? Well, most... NIV in the UK is not done through helmets. Luigi, I, uh, I, I wish it were. I wish there was more. Um, but one important, two important things to note, skin breakdown, and also make sure, please, that uh, you make sure in a single limb circuit there's a vented mask. We have, we have you know, SUIs every year relating to, uh, uh, even at St. Thomas's, I think, Luigi. 
there are the nasal bridge sparing masks that can be used, and of course the helmet masks as well. I'm sure. I'm sure that's the wrong picture. I'm sure there's a mistake in that picture or something, Luigi. No. What about the initial pressure settings? Well, an understanding of the physiology helps. We need to know what the loads are on the respiratory muscle pump, the capacity in the neural respiratory drive. So in COPD, you need higher EPAP, perhaps, uh, in patients with a threshold load. You need a short TI for those patients who are hyperinflated. And with those patients with high drive, you need PSV mode rather than PCV. Uh, that's just to show that, actually, if you titrate the EPAP according to the uh, to optimise patients to minimise their expiratory flow limitation, uh, then you minimise their work of breathing their neural respiratory drive. So patients with OS, OSA, OHS may need greater uh, support in terms of EPAP to overcome their upper airways obstruction. They have higher elastance. They need a longer TI to inflate their lungs and maximise their tidal volume. Higher IPAPs because of the intra increase of intra-abdominal pressure. And they, too, develop intrinsic PEEP. And similarly with the neuromuscular disease patients. So how do we predict NIV failure and acute respiratory failure? Well, you could refer to the 2005 study of Confalonieri, which looked at the probability of NIV failure and exacerbations of COPD. But I have to confess, although supremely accurate, I think it's quite difficult pragmatically to look uh, at that on a daily basis. What are the predictors of NIV failure and acute exacerbations of COPD across these multiple now old studies? Well, I think the thing to look at really most of all is whether there's been an improvement in your physiology and the patient comfort and the patient's respiratory state after one hour. And that's reflected in this 2017-18 NCPOD report. Give NIV early, give it in chronic obstructive COPD and they have the best outcomes. Give it in mild to moderate um, respiratory acidosis and give it appropriately in uh, good time. There's a great new um, and very, very well validated uh, predict risk prediction score, mortality prediction score called the NEVO, published in the ERJ just last year, which identified these what seven independent predictors, six independent predictors uh, of mortality. Um, so consolidation, impaired consciousness, atrial fibrillation, severe acidosis, late acidemia, <coughs> and underlying severe level of dyspnea. And you can categorize these patients if they've got a high NEVO, very high NEVO score, mortality is 80% at, at, at 90 days. And the great thing about this score is you can, you can assess their prognosis before you've even given the NIV. Again, I'm not going to dwell too much on hypoxic re respiratory failure. Suffice to say that delaying intubation is, is, is bad for you. Um, I'm going to skip through these in the interest of time. Um, because I think, once again, I think, Louise, you've covered the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the hypoxemic respiratory failure area very, very thoroughly. So, look, in summary, the issues around acute NIV and hypercapnic respiratory failure now are not around new data, how to do things in a novel way, but to do what we know works in a manner that is safe and efficacious, not just for the patients in specialist areas, or in specialist units, or in... Uh, in um, um, uh, in ICUs, but also across the board from the emergency department all the way to discharge. And to administer it in a timely way with the appropriate settings, it remains a life-saving mode, mode of ventilation. We should focus on quality of delivery, and that includes more research, better clinical education, uh, and, and, and be a better understanding of the process through which patients go as they receive NIV. Understanding the physiology is undoubtedly important, and the early identification of the high-risk patient is important to avoid or expedite the need for escalation of care. I appreciate that's been a quite a brisk romp and some quite old data, but I hope you appreciate really now it's about quality of care rather than generating new data. Thanks very much. Thank you.